Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, Jacob, how much? What are, what are we? What's the timing of this? So, as we announced before, sadly, the coffee refresh in the afternoon just isn't happening. So, hopefully, we can go. So, we started a little late on this. So I figure we'll go. We'll do the Q and A here for 15 or something like that, and then we'll just transition into the last panel. That seems okay, but obviously take that for granted if we need. We won't be having a break. So that's okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I'm sitting here thinking that <clears throat> um, this panel seems rather upbeat to me, <laughs> which is a good thing for the mid-afternoon. And um, there are a lot of students in the room. Many of us are academics. I think those of us who, not all of us, but those of us who are academics are not academics because we enjoy retreating to the ivory tower, but because we feel that somehow in the institutions in which we work, as research institutions, there is hope for the future. Um, and you've all talked about what I'm going to ask again in a certain way, but I, I just, when Reinhold and Jacob contacted us, you know, my first reaction was, oh my goodness, we've been around so many blocks in New Orleans. Um, what are we gonna what are we gonna talk about now? <laughs> we don't we don't want to talk here anymore. We want to get busy, we want to do things. Um, all of you in one way or another talked about doing things. And so I'm I'm wondering, you know, where do you think for these students sitting out here who also want to do things, where are the productive lines of research? toward that future, from at every scale. You know, where are, what are the projects that we need to be thinking about pouring that research into at every scale, from the small to the grandiose? Um, could you just talk some more about that? I'd, I'd really like to go forward. <laughs> Dan's nodding his head. Um, I mean, um, I think that if you look at the Green New Deal proposal from New Consensus, which is the think tank behind AOC, there is a remarkably thin amount on the built environment. Um, this, there's a lot that has been done in economic modeling. What would it look like to adjust various knobs in terms of climate change? Um, there's been a very long debate about green jobs, understandably, and that's good. Um, there's been a lot of debate about the principles of what the difference between climate justice and green capitalism would look like. But on the question of the built environment, I don't think there has been much, and especially about what a big egalitarian program of investment for the built environment would be. Um, we know that investment, targeted investment in communities of color and low-income communities is what the Green New Deal wants to look like, and there's a bit of a model in California that one could study. But all this is to say, I do think there is a huge scope for work for designers, architects, engineers, um, many and other forms of applied sciences. And there's a big question, I don't think we know what the answer is, what is like an innovative built environment program look like that is not the kind of unequal eco project reinforcing catastrophe that we have now. So if we can somehow bring together some social questions and some of that built environment technical expertise, I think we can start to build something very new. And you know, the last time the left was strong was maybe post-war. It's been like 50 years. And the models of intervening in the built environment have utterly changed. So it seems to me this is the kind of biggest gap in our knowledge right now. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a time for young people to do. We could literally build a new world slash traffic. <laughs> I suppose one way to address that question and what I was trying to get at is um, if we look at models, alternative models of actual development in terms of architecture and housing in the state of Louisiana, and if we ask what has the state of Louisiana supported and encouraged, it's pretty pathetic. Um, and, and my point of the presentation is to say, right now, the most innovative work I see going on is actually in Southeast Asia. The Thai government has been funding innovations in this notion of amphibious houses and amphibious urbanism. In Vietnam and Bangladesh, the governments have stepped up and realized that in order to move forward, some kind of innovation, and, and the second point of this is to say, I, 
I think it's really interesting and important to think about the difference between when large-scale planning is being put in place, certain players are involved in that. But there's a difference between the small-scale moves that, what does a homeowner do? And in Louisiana, you lift your house, you, there's a couple of moves possible. But in Asia, we're seeing these small-scale moves are incredibly interesting and very innovative. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not the exclusion of large-scale planning, but there are two parallel things going on. They're grouping with large-scale problems, but they're actually developing innovative small-scale responses. And um, it's curious to me why we in Louisiana have not even started that discussion, much less put forward models. I will say this, that according to FEMA, FEMA will support the lifting of houses, but they will not support the amphibious houses. So if a homeowner decides that they want to pursue the amphibious house, FEMA does not support that. So already in place there are policies that will encourage certain things and discourage other. The last thing I'll say is it's very interesting to me. I ended the last slide I showed was tidal power. In 2010, apparently the Army Corps of Engineers started an experimental project late in the game compared to other places in the world, and then it just disappeared. Does anyone here know what happened to the 2010 project of tidal power that the Army Corps of Engineers was experimenting with? So this is interesting to me, whereas in Australia and almost any other place, tidal power has just become a norm. Uh, so has so many other alternative sources. We have more water here than we know what to do with. I look at the river and wonder why don't we have, you know, a tide, uh, why don't we have a turbine in the river? I won't get into why, but there are very specific reasons why. So all of this is to say, um, and, and I'll stop, but we would do well to keep looking at other parts of the world that are also dealing with issues of life in the delta, the future of sea level rise, and water. And we have extraordinary examples to, to look at, to, to think about. And I want to add to that where I was going in terms of the, 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 the talk of that is that the assumption is that the African American community is outside of this conversation. That we'll do this for the city, meaning other people will do this for the city or to other places, and then you get the benefit of it. When the reality is just the opposite. Whether they meaning people in general are in institutions, meaning in universities or not. They are always thinking. One thing I learned from a lot of students from Asia was exactly what you're talking about, and it's coming from informal settlements. What is starting to happen in the United States, and we haven't talked about it enough, is we call it homeless encampments. They're really, you know, informal settlements. And we have not come to terms with how we make sense of that. And, and in that sense, there are survival mechanisms and other things happening right in front of us. But because of the way we've set up certain things and hierarchies and the way we have organized ourselves, we don't even ask. One of the big things that happened here is the Sewage and Water Board has pumping stations that's moving water out constantly in crisis in the way that it's managed and, and everything that's happened with it. But the people who actually operate these stations know a hell of a lot and I never asked. The reason why I know is because I go in and ask them. All right? And you're not supposed to go in. They've brought my classes in and explain water in such dynamic ways. All right, and then they said, no photographs. All right, and that's good. Everybody agreed, and we go out. The thing is that you, you have this knowledge, but there is this hierarchy of who's supposed to know and who's not supposed to figure out these very critical issues. Yeah, I, an Orleans Parish is really a totally different animal. Um, you know, we work with a lot of state and federal agencies, and, 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 the, and the cooperation level is just unbelievable. Uh, you know, with, with this program that we have up in Angola Penitentiary, uh, it's a 1500 hour horticulture course that's being taught by Baton Rouge Community College, which we financially support. 
uh, and, and these trustees as they are being released, uh, we pay for their licensing uh, and, and we find them a job. So when they walk out the door that next day, they have a job to go to. And we not only pay the licensing fees, but we also have monies available for rental deposits and security deposits. Uh, and in working with some of these agencies here or at the city level, um, you know, they're like, well, you know, they, they need to come in for, for an interview. And we're like, well, that's not how our program works. How about you know, like a Skype interview? <laughs> and, uh, and that was just unheard of. They were like, well, you know, we, we, we just we don't even do that. We haven't even ever considered that. Uh, and it's really sort of changing the, 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 the thinking here uh, as to how um, these agencies relate uh, not only to the, to the taxpayers but also to, to all of the residents that are here in New Orleans to, to propel this thing forward. I mean, down where we are in the Lower Ninth Ward, I don't know if you all have been into, into Araby uh, and into, you know, Chalmette. Um, you know, the development that's occurred there has just been astronomical. Uh, and along the St. Cloud Corridor, we have um, some private properties that are owned by the city of New Orleans, that are owned by churches, that are owned by nonprofits, and, um, and 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 to get the city to go in to get in there and do some some uh, you know, some code enforcement, a little bit of blight eradication, uh, it, it's just unheard of. And um, you know, we, we we just I had to have a, a group come in from Baylor University in Texas to pick up 500 tires a couple of weeks ago because we couldn't get the city to go down there and do it. Uh, so it's those types of struggle with uh, to make our local government uh, more accountable. Uh, and it's a really serious problem. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd just like to say something about the, 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 the flooding uh, in, in Louisiana. I mean, I, I really think the, um, the innovative approaches that, that Anthony showed from across the world about how to, how to live with water are, are really something that we can, that we can uh, take home. And I, I think that in terms of Carol, Carol's point about you know what, where are the opportunities for our students? I think one of the things that we have to do. I don't want to try to say it's really complicated and it takes a specialist, but a flood is not a flood is not a flood, right? There's a difference between a storm surge with waves and very active water, and that Mississippi flood out there, which is kind of a, a long rise over two months and a long decline over six weeks and the kind of um, rainfall flooding that we had in Baton Rouge that Tracy talked about this morning. They're different kinds of things. And so, you know, I, you might have sensed my frustration uh, in, in my remarks about the, the, good, the good news is that everybody understands there's a relationship between wetlands and storm surge. The bad news is everybody thinks there's a relationship and they think it's really simple, right? These things really, uh, getting the right building for the right flood and the right approach really takes expertise. And that's what we need our students to be able to help people do, really tailor these solutions to the problems that different places have. So I hope you get some good students. <laughs> okay, thanks. How about, thanks all of you. How about any questions um, from the audience? try to be succinct. Um, I'm in my first year at UNO for the planning program, and um, you'll have to forgive my existential crisis right now, but <clears throat> I noticed that planning in this regard today seems a little bit more reactive, and I'm noticing that no one's really talking about um, renewable energy at all, and I'm just wondering um, if that plays into your work at all. You mentioned tidal energy and the Green New Deal, of course, but um, I'm feeling like a lot of the issues that we're discussing um, are sort of reactive solutions, and I'm just wondering how we can get ahead and be proactive about maybe minimizing all the damage that is going to happen from climate change, and maybe talk about policy that would be helpful too. Because of time, I, yeah. I, didn't have, I could have broken each of almost every one of those projects uh, in Mohammed Reiswan. There's a solar panel on those floating uh, schools. If you go to Lagos, there's solar panels, there's tidal uh, It's Almost all of the projects that I was showing were a lot, it's a given that the renewable energy is integrated into many of those designs. And so, and again, 
I couldn't do everything in 10 minutes, sure. but, but I, I, th I think to try to address your question, I think it's central, and I think we would be um, undermining ourselves to not demand that, that they're integrated and that they should become a norm and, given, and, and a given. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is, again, looking at comparative models um, in Medellin in Colombia, I happened to uh, spend some time there looking at some of the new projects and I had the great fortune of meeting the contractor who was responsible for building most of the libraries, most of the new civic work there, and it was astounding to me when he said, just in passing, every civic building must be 100% passive. And with that, you could ask the question, I'm sure you could point out a list of civic buildings in the U.S. that are 100% passive, right? Can you name one? Can anyone here name one? So it, it, it raises questions, fundamental questions about how is it that other countries or places can not just aim but accomplish, accomplish these things and when we reflect back on many of the models that we're just toying with, we see this a misalignment. Uh, it, it's sort of extraordinary. So I'll end here just saying, I think it is really important to constantly uh, look around at your neighbors and, and open up and listen and kind of learn from what other people are doing. Real quick, I think in about 2005 to 2008, 2009, you would have felt the thing you were looking for, it was everywhere. Everybody now is restricted back. You cannot do that on that building or try that experiment here and there. And so it's much more, I think, um, less spoken of, but people are still doing what, you know, what they can. Other questions in the back? Maybe we'll take a few. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about, um, in terms of these conversations about the improvements, going back to the CPRA, it's, it's a tremendous piece of policy, but it's almost a, a lot, the original iteration was so much about uh, the engineering of it and kind of this question of bringing in communities into the conversation. So in terms of your work or excellent kind of workers you have seen in, in improving sustainability and improving resilience of communities, what tactics or approaches or processes do you think are useful or critical for ensuring you have that your process is informed both by the community and by the technical expertise that's needed for that to be a successful project? Uh, thanks for a really interesting panel. So um, my first question is for Daniel. Um, thanks for a very inspiring talk. So uh, my question is uh, whether about whether you can sort of relate the argument that you made about housing um, to the question of environmental justice um, and sort of uh, sort of recognizing that there is unequal exposure to environmental risk that persists in U.S. cities. Sort of what kind of political coalitions would be necessary to address uh, both uh, sort of the this vision of um, and of green public housing and environmental justice uh, together, whether you see kind of synergies between those two, uh, two social struggles. Um, my second question is about um, social vulnerability uh, and sort of whether you can talk a little bit more about um, the kinds of different responses by communities or particular stakeholders um, to some of the strategies that have been proposed, like sediment diversions, so sort of, um, I read a bit about the shippers and sort of other, um, other groups responding um, sometimes negatively to some of the solutions that have been proposed. I'm just sort of curious to hear about the range of social responses. Can we, can we take two more? Is that okay? We'll, we'll sure. Okay. Yeah, I have a question for Tom and Daniel. Um, as someone that was here during Katrina and active in the public housing movement, I was certainly aware of Common Ground. Uh, but a lot of people had questions about what happened to the leadership on your webpage. It talks about, it, in the passive tense, it was founded. It was founded by Malik Rahim and some other activists. And they were summarily kind of kicked out and, and then you kind of popped in. So people were kind of, I was curious, and others that were active in the public housing movement were kind of curious about what actually happened. And as for, uh, for Daniel, um, you're, you were kind of implicitly critical of kind of these self-help 
initiatives that kind of popped up post they were dominant post Katrina and the need for kind of a big bold program to deal with inequality uh, and, and climate change would play is clearly an issue here in, in New Orleans and around the, around the globe. Um, and we shared in the public housing movement, we kind of shared that criticism that, you know, we had, I think it's literally millions of people, if you count the, the, those that came multiple times, that came down as volunteers, and yet it's still a disaster area uh, for working class people. And we always said that people came down as part of a social movement, uh, kind of in the tradition of the civil rights movement, that would have been a real contribution. But by coming down as volunteers, it kind of played into the self-help, um, neoliberal, uh, reconstruction model that left the state off the hook. So my question is around the politics of the Green New Deal. I mean, it's good to have a plan to put it out, um, a blueprint, but what we really need a real discussion about is the politics that are going to get get us there. And I think any kind of plan is going to run into this huge, complex, philanthropic, nonprofit complex that emerged here. That they're going to be a real political a, a obstacle, a trench that this kind of movement is going to have to confront in addition to fire and all those people. But I don't know, if, you know, the Jacobin who's leading this discussion uh, have talked about this or planning to discuss it. Hey, um, so I, I just think it's interesting that we're in Louisiana on a, talking about greenwashing and the um, sort of the oil and gas industry hasn't come up at all um, as the sort of historical producer of, of risk in this in this um, in this environment. I find it really sort of interesting for those of you who are working in this space. And I've been working in the restoration space for a little while. Um, you know, a few sort of fabulously wealthy global companies are profiting off of the destruction of this coast, to put it in really stark terms, and. I'm wondering how, you know, those of you who work in this, do you see that playing out? How do you see it playing out? Um, or is it something that's sort of um, in the background? I don't, I don't know how to, how to look at it well. Okay. Um, I think we take these in any order. So, yeah, thank you. Um, great questions, folks. Um, I, there was something, uh, what, maybe it was the first one, uh, anyway. Um, so, I, I did want to talk about, and I forgot earlier, about a, a, a planning effort that was recently undertaken called LA Safe. Some of you may be familiar with it, which was very much designed as a, as a grassroots planning effort. We heard a lot of talk on the first panel this morning about, about the need for, for community engagement, and totally, totally agree with that. And so the idea was that the, the, to take the analysis of the future condition that was done for the state's coastal master plan and take it out into the communities and say, look, this is what's going to happen. What do you want to do? And, and I live uh, you know, down the bayou, not very far from Eldridge and Oshawa Island, and it was happening down in, my, in, in our community. And I will tell you that when faced with the maps of, of the land loss for the future and how deep the water was going to be, most of the people in the communities could not process it. It was too much change. They could not relate to that at all. And, and so what happened with the whole LA same process was they went through this kind of bottom-up planning process and they, they ended up with, with projects that solve today's problems, not projects that solve tomorrow's problems. And I think that is one of the challenges that we've had. We've, trying to do a much better job for the 2023 master plan about involve, of having regional work groups and different kinds of things and kind of getting ideas from, from, um, from communities, from regions, not, not it being a Baton Rouge kind of top-down plan. But at the same time, the idea is to really look into the future. And to some extent, I think that's, that's also um, you know, kind of one way of thinking about um, the the question about about the oil and gas industry, which clearly are, are a key element of the whole Louisiana coast story. And um, you know, I've spent you know time 
examining land loss processes and canals and those kinds of things, and have done a few lawsuits against oil companies and was in the middle of being vilified during the BP oil spill and all of that kind of thing. Um, but the way I look at it personally this is, is, is that most of the things that happened on the coast that caused problems were 20th century things, right? I'm really focused on what we're going to do for the 21st century and how we're going to fix it. You know, why it happened is not the same as what's going to fix it. And so that is also probably a little bit of a response to, and I'll, this will be quick, is the question about how do people respond to the plan and the, and the um, and what you've seen in several of the presentations today about about people complaining, uh, fishermen particularly complaining about these these really large diversions of water uh, to kind of reinvigorate this delta building process that are linchpin part of the plan, and it's the same. I think it's the same approach. Is that they are very reasonably concerned about their livelihood today. They are not thinking about their grand, you know, three, two or three generations into the future. And so my personal thinking at the minute is that just focusing on 50 years into the future, while I think that's vitally important, it's not the only thing that you need to do. And we need to have these, this came up in the, in the was an idea that came up in the changing course competition that somebody mentioned this morning. This idea of kind of generational planning. You need to focus, if you don't, for the big, really big things, they take a long time and a lot of momentum to, to, you have to build a lot of momentum to get really big things moving. So you have to think decades into the future, but you also have to kind of plan to transition towards that. And you need a kind of, we need, a, we need like a 15 year plan a 35-year plan and a 60-year plan, not just one 50-year plan. That's that's my the way I think about it. I'm not sure that uh, the state folks are ready for that. Okay, so I just sorry. No, no, no. no thank you, thank you, thank you. Just be brief. <laughs> All right, so we're, 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 you know, when you do talk to these shrimpers, you do talk to these oysters, and you ask them, you know, where were you fishing? Where were you doing oystering? You know, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and, and when you have that conversation with them, you know, they, they do realize that, that yes, this diversion, it's a, it's a crouch. No one knows if this is actually going to work and how effective it's going to be. But it's the only plan that we all have. How effective is this going to be? Well, you know, we, you know, but it is. It's, yeah, every year. But I mean, but it, it, it is, you know, this is a, it's, it's a huge experiment that we're all undertaking. But I mean, a lot of these communities along the coast that they now that are, are within the levee system, you know, one of the big problems that we've had are, are, are people being able to get flood insurance and being, people being able to get mortgages and people being able to stay in place in these communities. Um, you know, what, what you don't want to have in our, uh, down in, in Montague where you have a public school, but teachers can't afford to buy houses, and uh, and and, they're, and they get tired of a hundred mile commute uh, to 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 go teach every day. And you have small industry that leaves, and you have the retail support that leaves, and all of a sudden these communities, you know, will cease to exist over time. Um, so you know, those are the types of things of working with these communities and, and letting them know that hey, you know, they're, you're you're within this levy system now, and and, we, and you can go ahead and begin moving forward. Uh, but with you know with you know, trees and plant materials and and doing some of the restoration effort uh, in conjunction with these you know state and federal programming that's, that's in place. And very quickly, I would say that part of what we're talking about is the reason I brought up the whole thing about codes of memory is that in fact I think people do think generationally what's going to happen 50, 60 years. These codes of memory are meant to actually be a way, a counter against history where you're written out of history, all right? And that's what I'm saying. There's such a wealth of knowledge of improvisation brought into the table with our hard sciences that would not be all out of the park, but we're like, you can't talk. You can't come to the table. You can't be here. And that, I'm like, 
It's not like people stop thinking. They think about other things in other ways. And if we could pull that energy together, whoa. So, um, to respond to something Denise just said, uh, that we need a 60-year plan, absolutely, we need a 50-year plan. I would add to that, we need a one-year plan, a two-year plan, and a five-year plan. We need ideas right now. What, I mean, and the reason I say that is because right now, what's on the table, if we use Yves de Jean Charles as a model, it says you retreat or perish, more or less. That's more or less the position to say. It says you retreat to higher ground and will acquire higher ground 50 miles, but to remain where you are is not an option. That's, that's what's being held. And I think we should at least reasonably test alternative strategies that if a community insists on staying, it's either the status quo at the moment or nothing. And I think when I say we need a one-year plan, a five-year plan, what are alternatives that we should be investigating immediately, at least to test the viability of these things? But that's not to say, of course, we should be thinking of very, very long-term plans. I, I don't think it can be either or. I think they both need to be at work in order to come up with a reasonable uh, proposition. Thanks. Um, thank you Last for the... Last word, Dan. Yeah, very quickly. Um, okay, two things. The, there are a lot of shitty nonprofits, but they're a symptom, not the cause. The cause of the problem is the financial industry, the real estate industry, and the oil industry. And that's clear. And um, the position of my co-editors of this Green New Deal series of Jacobin is that the fossil fuel industry needs to be nationalized and euthanized, that the executives should be tried for crimes against humanity, um, the International Criminal Court. Um, the, that's going to be difficult to do, but, you know, we have the smoking guns that have been published, so I think we will. Um, and then just very briefly, I mean, the coalitions that have achieved the great justice gains in the U.S., and I'm thinking about something like the Mount Laurel Doctrine in New Jersey, which forces every single community in the state to affirmatively zone for affordable housing. These victories are won by coalitions of labor organizers, racial justice organizers, um, environmentalists, progressive politicians, and often left-wing lawyers who suffered many years of boredom in their lives to try to make things better than the rest of us. Um, and the only thing I would just add to that, and we've talked about this at Jacobin and elsewhere, the need for a serious political strategy to defeat massively entrenched wealthy industries. But the last thing I'll add is you can't, the United States private sector union density is 7%. So the labor movement as it stands is not strong enough on its own. And the electoral infrastructure of the primary system is something that can put millions of people into the streets. And if you look at geopolitics right now and you think what would it mean for the United States to have a president in 2021 who advocates climate investment, which would mean that then the US, Europe, and China, over half the economy, over half global emissions, we're all racing to have the most aggressive climate investment instead of two or three of those people being opposed to it. That is a huge transformation. And what's gonna happen in the next you know, year and a half in terms of the primaries are massively important for the climate. So I think, yes, there's a huge amount we can do with the built environment, so on other things that we talked about, but also like there's no day now that passes where, where the democratic primaries aren't happening, and the potential for the planet, and then ultimately for cities like New Orleans, um, to either really benefit from or really suffer from a series of kind of defeats or victories in these primary elections is huge. It's huge. So th this is really an insane moment where Americans, for better or worse, have a massive influence on what's going to happen for decades in the atmosphere and therefore in the streets and the country and the fields that they live in. So I think this is a huge turning point moment over the next couple of years, and I hope that we all find a way to seize that moment.